Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Symposium on the Ethics of Immigration Enforcement. My name is Jacob Beas. I'm from South Dakota. I'm a third year law student here at Penn State Law and I'm looking to practice in immigration and or labor law. My name is Amira Vasquez. I'm a lawyer from Peru. I am a candidate for a Master of Law and I am looking for practice litigation, immigration law and criminal law. Samir and I are clinical students with Penn State Law's Center for Immigrants Rights Clinic. The clinic is a nationally recognized in-house clinic at Penn State Law in which law students take on projects and cases focusing on three areas, community education and outreach, pro bono representation, and policy research. We are honored to welcome everyone, both in person and online, to the symposium. The materials of the speakers and presenters can be found on Penn State Law's website. And for those attending via Zoom interested in CLE credits, there should be a Zoom link posted in the chat that will take you to the forms to complete for those credits. Before we get started, we'd also like to thank our sponsors for this event, the Rock Ethics Institute, the Center for Immigrants Rights Clinic, the Department of Philosophy, Latino and Latina Studies, and the Schreyer Honors College. It's a great pleasure for us to introduce our speaker today, who is going to talk with us about the ethics of immigration enforcement through the lens of her experience and expertise. This is a subject in which we should all be deeply interested because it falls short of what justice demands. Our speaker, Bridget Cambria, has spent almost her entire career successfully representing individuals with family-related immigration matters, removal defense, asylum-related issues, claims under the Violence Against Women Act, issues concerning immigration detention, application for post-conviction relief, and other complex areas of immigration law. She is the co-founder of ALDEA, the People's Justice Center, an immigration attorney and advocate for immigrant rights, children and families. And moderating this discussion with Ms. Bridget Cambria will be Dean Shoba Siva Prasad Wadia. Dean Wadia is the Dean of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion, a Samuel Weiss faculty scholar and clinical professor of law at Penn State Law in University Park. Her research focuses on the role of prosecutorial discretion as well as the intersection of national security, race, and immigration law. We'll be taking questions to be answered at the end of the conversation. Please prepare to stand in front of the microphone beside the stage. And for our participants in the Zoom session, please use the Q&A function to grab your questions or use the chat box. We want to take this opportunity to thank you for your participation in this symposium and invite you to join us in welcoming Ms. Bridget Cambria and Dean Shobagwadi. Well, thank you, Jacob and Samira, and welcome everyone. And welcome, Bridget Cambria. I am delighted to be in conversation with you today. And want to ask many questions about your work in immigration and ethical considerations. But first, I want to learn a bit more about your journey. Uh, and you, you spent your early life in Reading, Pennsylvania. Uh, could you just start by talking to us about how it shaped your journey and professional journey in particular? Sure, and um, thank you, Shova, for inviting me here. You're one of my idols. And I just want you to know that um, I'm so grateful for your clinic and all of the good work that they have done and are doing. So thank you very much for that really nice introduction. Um, um, I'm very happy to be here and to share my experience. I am from Reading, Pennsylvania, and I'm only about two hours away from Reading right now. Um, and I encourage everyone that's watching uh, online and is here to visit Reading, Pennsylvania, because it's an uh, amazing city, um, even though it is pretty dilapidated, honestly. Uh, Reading is a highly immigrant community. Um, it's also one of the most impoverished communities in the country. Um, and that sort of intersection leads us to the fact that that's why we have an immigration prison sort of in our backyard. When prisons bring jobs, um, and unfortunately, that's what brings uh, the Burks facility, which we'll talk about in a little bit, 
Um, so right outside Reading, Pennsylvania. Um, I grew up um, in Reading, uh, right outside. Um, I come from an Italian and Irish family, so family values are very important. So is a, a really strong work ethic. Uh, I've worked probably since I could walk. My, my grandparents were entrepreneurs, so they had lots of businesses uh, throughout the, the county of Berks, where I grew up, and in the city of Reading. It was restaurants, it was apartment buildings, pools, barber shops, whatever my, my, um, my grandparents or their brothers and sisters could do to, to make money, they did, um, because we were an immigrant family, maybe two generations ago. And their goal was to make things better for their kids. So uh, my dad, who's probably um, one of my strongest influences, gave me a, a very strong work ethic, probably too strong. He's a workaholic. Um, and my mother gave me the interest in law. My dad's actually a nuclear physicist, if you can believe it. And uh, so he instilled probably the brain that I have that allows me to practice law the way that I do. Um, and they're very supportive of what I do. And I think that from them is where I got the interest to actually help people. And really it's just generation uh, after, genera after generation after generation providing the opportunities for their children and their children and their children to do the things they dreamed of. Um, my dad, for example, his parents spoke Italian, but forbid him from learning Italian because their interest was him assimilating into um, society. So they grew up in the city of Reading at that time. The city was Italian, Polish, um, and oh, I'm missing one, probably Irish. Um, and each, and the city was segmented into those different uh, ethnicities. Now the city is 70 to 80% Spanish speaking. It's highly immigrant community, um, highly Dominican, Guatemalan, um, Mexican, like all these different communities in one city. And I don't think many people know about that. Most people see the city of Reading as somewhere that might be dangerous or poor. That's not what it is. It's a whole bunch of immigrants living together in that community and they're completely unrecognized and not served by the people that represent them. But it's a really amazing and interesting place. So I want you to go visit. There's wonderful food because you can get food from any country. Um, it's an amazing place to visit. Um, so I encourage going there and we can talk more about how in immigration intersects with communities like that. Um, but being around all of that growing up, I think is sort of what piqued my interest when immigration started to affect my life personally, and then it became a mission after that. So. That's a great story, Bridget. Thank you. And I, I can certainly attest to the tremendous work ethic. And now I know where one of the primary sources are um, from. Until recently, Burks, we've taught, talked about this immigration detention facility, was one of three family detention centers um, in the country. And I, I thought for those in the audience who are less familiar with what family detention is, um, you could describe what it looks like and what the conditions of family detention are. Yeah, so I, I think that, um, first of all, just understanding the extreme amount of detention that's done in the United States. Detention is an infrastructure that's created in the United States in, for immigration purposes to the tune of, I think right now, 34,000. That's a lot of people in detention. Immigration detention is also civil detention, which means it can never be punitive. Yet people are in the same jails as people that are serving criminal sentences. It's entirely punitive. Um, family detention is another mechanism of that. And it's, try to, it's trying to make incarceration acceptable. It's never acceptable. So you can't turn a prison into a childcare center or a summer camp by, by changing the color of the walls, by putting a playground outside. Uh, the idea of family detention is always to incarcerate families and keep them in a place where they're unable to leave. Uh, and it is entirely punitive and the punishment that is inflicted is for the purpose of deterrence, which we will talk about in a little bit as well. The point is, if we punish this, this group of families that maybe, just maybe, they'll tell their families back home and then they'll, stop, they'll somehow stop people from fleeing violence. That's the purpose of family detention. And that's why there were only three facilities. There were only three facilities because frankly, most states would find it abhorrent to jail 
children with their parents for absolutely no reason. But the three facilities were Berks, uh, it was the Berks County Youth Center, then it became the Berks County Residential Center. Um, and then the two facilities in Texas, the Dilly Family Residential Center and the Carnes Family Residential Center. And it held to the tune of 2,500 people, uh, which was a large number of families, but that wasn't by and large the number of families immigrating, right? So the idea was to punish a group to affect the entire immigration system, failed entirely. But family detention itself, what it looks like, it looks like um, buildings where children can't leave. It looks, where, it looks like ch uh, buildings where children's growth is stunted. It looks like buildings where parents are not allowed to be parents. It, it looks like a place where people are psychologically harmed because they wonder, what did I do wrong as a child? And why can't my parents take me out of this place? The dynamics of, of how it affects a family and family detention are staggering. And it's almost more cruel sometimes than an adult facility because what it might not intend to do, but certainly does, is it destroys the parent-child bond and relationship. And it replaces the parental role um, for the parent to the child to the guard. So a guard decides when your child eats, a guard decides when your child gets medicine, a guard decides when your child can go outside, a guard makes all those decisions for you, but you're with your parent. So, so the role is, is taken away. And um, I can give some examples. So for, for children that were in family detention for really long periods of time and some years, um, they would tell, tell me afterwards, my child won't go to school because the school looks like a detention center. So they won't even walk into the school anymore. Um, behavior problems. I know what it's, I think one parent said, that her, her son told her, I know what prison's like already, so I can behave badly. Um, so it, it's, it's another kind of animal. It's, it's sometimes worse than an adult detention center because of the cruel nature of it. It's also made much more cruel by the fact that it's chosen, right? Families are placed there by choice, not because they've done anything wrong, really, at all. They're all in a lawful process. But they're chosen to be punished in that way um, to send a message and nothing else. And the punishment to send the, the punishment basically to send a message is at the expense of children's lives, development, and a family relationship. Um, and honestly, I think that any any community that would look at what happens to kids that are in those types of places would completely uh, be um, uh, um, horrified by the effect it had and probably would repel it but it's kept so secret. You don't see the insides of the facilities. You don't hear from the kids or the parents. It's all kept you know, behind closed doors. And that secrecy is very important. That's why it's so hard to get into facilities. That's why they try so hard to keep attorneys away. Um, and the point was to, to keep it hidden because it wasn't for the purpose of, of community consumption. It was a purpose of deterring and sending a message to other people. So you paint a very vivid picture, Bridget, and it's, it's, a, it's also reminding me of um, some of the trips that our clinic has taken to Berks um, and what we've witnessed when, you know, it's time for a kid to go to school um, during an uh, incredible fear interview, for example. And, and later on, I, I really do want to talk about, you know, how, if at all, the facility changed from one administration to the next. Um, but before that, because I think this is so important to the unique perspective and lived experience you have, um, before you went to law school, you were an employee at the Berks County Residential Center. Sure. Um, and I would really like to hear what that experience taught you um, and how, if at all, it motivated you to go into the law? So the Berks County Residential Center, as it's called now, is the oldest, or was, thankfully, the oldest family detention center in the United States. It actually was there since 2001. And I can guarantee you that the majority of people, even people that practice immigration, never knew it was there for over 20 years, right? Um, I worked there for as long as I could take it for about a year um, 
around 2002, it was just before I went to, to law school. And the reason that I went there is my undergraduate studies were in criminology and specifically uh, kids who commit crime, because that's what I was interested in studying. And that's what I wanted to get into in my uh, real world career. Um, and when I went to apply for a job, it was a job called shelter care counselor. And I was like, oh, this is perfect. I'm gonna work in a child's shelter and I'm gonna be a counselor. And you know that sort of goes with everything that I had studied. And the uh, facility was split into juvenile delinquent, juvenile dependents and immigration kids and families. Um, so I actually signed up because I wanted to work in juvenile detention. And um, when I got there and I did the training, I, I realized very quickly that I wasn't a counselor. Um, and in fact, they put me in the immigration unit because I was not a big, I'm a little bigger now, but I wasn't a big, you know, tough person. Because the point was, is I needed to be able to restrain people. I needed to be able to shackle people. And in reality, I was a correctional officer for children. So they put me in the immigration unit because those were the kids that wouldn't cause me as many problems as like a 21 or 22 year old girl. Um, and I actually was kind of disappointed to be in the immigration unit because I really wanted to work with kids who were criminals and these immigration kids, they did nothing wrong, right? Um, so in the immigration unit, um, they detained children there age that were unaccompanied, meaning no parent, from age about six to 17 by themselves. And in the family unit, there were whole families uh, together. They were separated uh, in the building. They weren't allowed to interact, except the kids could interact when it was school time. Um, it was a, a hard job, and it was a hard job because it had an ethical dilemma. The dilemma was, I felt that being there as a person that didn't have a correctional sort of perspective, um, that having somebody there to um, support the kids helped them. But at the same time, being there um, sort of facilitated the ability to detain children. So it was very difficult. It was really difficult. Um, but I realized very quickly there were two types of people there. There were people there like me that were like, um, wow, I thought this was going to be a counselor. And there were there, there were people there that, that enjoyed restraining children. You know, they were there for the correctional purpose. Um, I was there for about a year. I saw children restrained. And just so you can picture what a restraining a child looks like and what, what the training was, is um, you, one person would take the child to the ground and then every appendage would be held by another person and they would rotate every 15 minutes. Sometimes it would last hours where they would just keep consistently rotate. And this, by the way, is 2002, right? Not 50 years ago, 2002. And they would do this not only to the juvenile delinquents or the, the dependent kids, also bad, right? But they would do it to the immigrant kids, sometimes pick fights, figure out a way to, to get the child upset. And also understand that these were kids, some of them alone, who had escaped extreme trauma, right? So they had these histories that, that propelled them to have mental health issues or, you know, kids act out. That's just the nature of being a child. And to, to have a response that would be a restraint technique for me was just horrifying. I never had to engage in one of those, but I did see it. All these dilemmas, right? If you're, if you're there and you're not doing something about it, you're kind of part of the problem. So what I realized quickly was um, that I had to figure out what I was going to do. I met the most wonderful kids that still I think about today. And I remember their names so I can like Google them to see how their cases went. Most are fine, um, but I did see a lot of deportations as well. Um, it, was a, it was a hard facility to work in because as a, as a guard, you did not know the immigration status of anyone or the case status of anyone um, but there were there were occasions where kids would just disappear so you know that when a kid disappears and nobody's getting you know sent to a family member um, you know what the result is so there were times that i'd go to work one day and be you know talking with a, a kid and then the next day that kid's gone like that and i remember very distinctly there was a, a jamaican girl who was um 
um, 16, she was turning 17. And um, she was like, we're going to celebrate my birthday tomorrow and like we're getting ready and I would always bring gifts, which, by the way, I got in trouble for every single time you're not allowed to do that. But you know just something little and I was like oh we're going to celebrate your birthday tomorrow and I came to the facility and she was gone because she didn't turn 17 she turned 18. So what happens in the facilities when you turn 18 you go to jail. Um, so she disappeared. Um, the the kids that were there I I know now that a lot of them did have attorneys but I never saw them right I, there were no visitations like the kids were really isolated and you know alone um, the kids that were there when I started a lot of them were still there when I left um, I don't know if they had um, you know access to uh, appropriate legal counsel not my concern but I know that they didn't physically come to the building so these kids were like really by themselves um, and I thought one of the other things I thought was really bad was um, access to phone. So if you wanted to call a parent, whether it was out of country or, or in country, or if you wanted to call a relative, you got three chais a week. And if you didn't get through, then you didn't get any calls. And imagine calling a different country, right? It doesn't always connect. You had three tries on the dial. And if you didn't connect, then you didn't get to talk to your family. So. A lot of these kids were just super isolated, uh, super sad, and um, it was very hard to, to witness it day after day. And in the end, I made the decision to leave um, because I got into law school and the decision to apply to law school um, was inherently because I wanted to do something where you could, you could meet a situation like that and make a difference, as opposed to me just feeling like I was continuing to facilitate um, the problem. Mm -hmm. And eventually that does happen. But um, when I did leave the facility, um, it was really hard. And I know that a lot of the kids stayed detained for years after I left. Um, many of them, you could, if you read the New York Times about the Berks County Youth Center, or you read other journals, all of those children are referenced because eventually they were stuck years in these facilities. Um, but you know, when I left, they gave me a card which I still have, and on it is everybody's goodbye. You know, because kids are great. You know, kids are just great. Like they're gonna say goodbye to me. Somebody who could leave while they had to stay there. Um, and on it, one of the kids wrote, "I wish you were already a lawyer, because then you could get me out of here." You know, so kids are smart and kids are nice and kids are sweet and we did that to them like we we tortured them and put them in these facilities for what. Um, because kids you know kids are great and they were great kids and I, I very much hope that they're all okay. So we will see how history repeats itself later um, and I, I I heard you more than once kind of use your formal role as shelter counselor interchangeably with guard right yeah. um and so you go to law school and you come back to reading and you end up back at burks yeah. representing families it it had to feel did it feel like a role reversal what was the experience of once an employee and then a visitor to a facility? I wasn't a visitor, I was a lawyer. So I think um, it was not a role reversal because I certainly had the same mentality. Okay. But um, I remember very distinctly when I quit that job, um, the, my boss at the time um, told me never to come back. Um, to that facility. So I actually didn't intend to go back, um, really, because over time, those children were actually released because there was actually uh, Amnesty International had done a write up on the abuses in that center, as well as other juvenile uh, immigration centers. So eventually there was a lull. Mm -hmm. um, in 2014, they started family detention again under the Obama administration. Um, which sort of necessitated again the importance of legal access. I actually started my law firm 
in March of 2014 in Reading, Pennsylvania. So before that, I was a lawyer in Philadelphia. Before that, I was a lawyer in Providence, Rhode Island, um, all always doing immigration. Um, but I never expected to be back in that facility. And I think that family detention started again in mass um, in 2014 in May. So literally two months after um, I opened my law office in Reading. And um, I got a call from a colleague who was um, in North Carolina. And she called me because she had been a trial attorney in Boston. And she had a family member um, that was reaching out to her because the family member's mother was detained in the Burke Center. And she goes, oh, I remember. I, I remembered your name from when I was a trial attorney and you were, you were pretty good. So she called me so that I would go visit this mother over at the facility. I was like, oh, this is great. You know, like I get to go back and it'll be interesting to take a case, right, mm -hmm. at the facility where I used to work. And when I went into the facility, swear to God, the same people were working there as when I worked there almost like, I don't know, it would be 13 years before, crazy. And they recognized me, also crazy. Um, and at first, very cordial and very nice. Um, there are some good staff members there and, you know, very cordial and nice and were very actually receptive because at that time, there were about 40 families, 30 to 40 families who had been stuck in the facility for months with no lawyers. Um, so it was sort of, they were very welcoming, like these women are very upset, like they're going to court, they have no lawyers, like you can, you know, come in and, and try and help them. And what I discovered is that none of them had attorneys and they had been stuck there for months. Um, so I met the first mom and uh, took her case. And I remember where I was at a, a visit and she's like, some people are in the hall that want to see you. And in the hall were at least 20 to 30 other mothers just standing with their papers, waiting to be helped. Um, and it, it, so was it a role reversal? Yeah, because you know, I could finally do sort of what maybe, you know, what maybe was supposed to happen, right? Mm -hmm. um, but it felt very awesome to be able to do something different than nothing, right? So when I was there, I could do nothing. Being a lawyer is actually a really awesome power. So for the law students that are here, like it's amazing what you can do as a lawyer, the lives you can change. It's an awesome power. It's a stupid piece of paper, right? But it's an awesome power. Um, so when you walk into a facility like that, you uh, and you are an attorney, you can actually do something about it. Um, so take that responsibility very seriously. But it was awesome to go in, and eventually we represented all of those moms um, in their cases, and then the rest is history. Well, that's why you're a hero and your work ethic comes shines. Um, so you you started your first representation of families at Burks in 2014 mm -hmm. when you hung a shingle in Reading. Um, this was during the Obama administration and Burks detention, last family detention, ran through the Obama administration, continued through the Trump administration. So it isn't really a policy that we can pin to one administration or the other. With that said, were there were there any comparisons you would make um, between family detention under Obama and Trump that are meaningful, um, or are there parallels that you might share? I think there are parallels. I think that both were bad and. You know, both were bad for their own reasons. It was difficult under the Obama administration because you expected it to be different, right? If you would say the stories of what happened to those families to any other practitioner or any other person, or, you know, I would go home and tell my parents, they'd tell me I was lying. You know, couldn't be telling the truth because that couldn't possibly happen. But, you know, during the Obama administration, we had kids detained two years with their parents. Under the Trump administration, we had kids detained two years with their parents. Uh, I think that the difference was is I would expect an administration where uh, immigration might be a priority, you know, humanitarian immigration might be a priority that 
that they would be receptive to the idea that maybe you shouldn't detain kids for that long or maybe you shouldn't mm -hmm. do that. It didn't happen. Under the Trump administration, the difference was we expected it. Um, and you know, then we could rely on our friends. It was hard to it was hard to get people to sympathize with anything involving kids in detention until families were separated. Then people started to watch and it started to be on the news and people became interested. But the reality is, is that we've been separating families for a really long time. And um, during the Obama administration, when I went in in 2014, the idea was deter, right? Send a message. So the message was you're not getting out of jail. Um, and we went and they also said they don't have claims, right? They're all like, they all have no like ability to get any status. In the first iteration in 2014, when we went in, the line of women, I couldn't get a pro, I couldn't get many pro bono attorneys to take the cases. There are a few, and I know one might be watching Matthew Archambault. So if she's if he's watching, he did take a case. Um, so out of those cases, every person that fought their case, that that wanted to go through the process, that fought their case won. I mean, who has a hundred percent success rate, right? And it was because what they were doing to these kids was so outrageous um, that judges were looking at the cases a little closer, right? So whether your case was one at the immigration judge level, whether it went to the BIA, every case overturned of the BIA, if we had to go to the Third Circuit, Third Circuit mm -hmm. success. So all the people that were telling these families, you don't have a case, all the people that were telling them to go back because there's no process for them, it was all a lie because they all absolutely had the right to claim protection. They all had legitimate claims and eventually they were hurt, right? But they had to sit in detention for two years for it. Um, unbelievable. I can't even imagine the amount of wasted money that was spent putting them in those facilities. And then during the Trump administration, the difference was the hurdles, right? So it was like, okay, you're winning too much. We're gonna change the game. Now the laws are different. We're gonna change the policies to make it harder. So now it's not just you can apply for protection. How about we just take that away? The transit ban, yeah, right? Yeah. Let's just switch it up so that you can't, you can't actually apply because you're winning too much. So then all the families got stuck there longer because then it was like, well, this isn't right. We're gonna sue because it's not fair to take the right to seek asylum away from kids and parents. And we sued in many different ways. Um, I don't even wanna tell you how many lawsuits. Um, but in the end, they all got access to asylum. And eventually, February of last year, all of the families were released. Um, but you have to understand that Berks was small, so we could provide universal representation, which is what we, we did. Uh, anyone that wanted a lawyer in that facility from 2014 to now has one. No other facility in the country has yeah. that, right? Yeah. Um, and February of last year, the families left, all of them. Um, and I'm very proud of the work that, that we did. And um, it's entirely because of the kids that I met 20 years ago that that, that was possible. So I wanna, that, that was um, such a rich description. I wanted to break down a few things because there were a few acronyms that were shared mm -hmm. too. Um, um, but, you know, immigration court, um, it's, it's actually housed within the Department of Justice. And so it's where you would go to face an immigration judge. Um, but if you lose at that level, then you would appeal to another agency in the Department of Justice called the Board of Immigration Appeals, which we all call the BIA. Um, and if you lose at the BIA, um, most, most people don't even appeal. Um, uh, but if, if you, are represented and you have a claim um, after the BIA, then you would go into a federal court. Um, and so in, in our region, that would be the Third Circuit Court of Appeals. You mentioned family separation and how the sort of Trump version of family separation increased people's interest in helping families at Burke's. Um, and it reminded me of an other version because there's so many different versions of family separation in our immigration system. The most visible, of course, was the one at the border that was highly visible, and it is visible literally too. Um, 
But another version of family separation, um, when it came to detained families, a few that we saw when we were down there were, you know, mom and kids being detained at Burks and then dad being detained in a different facility, um, even though they all arrived together at the same airport or at the same border. Um, so that's just another way of seeing um, family detention, family separation, um, and, and a version that was very traumatic. Let me give you a couple examples. So um, it, that's absolutely true. And family detention facilitated separation often, and often the dad was taken away. Sorry, dads. But um, they thought that it would be better, right, for a mom to be with their child, and then they take dad to a different facility. So two examples. One, um, where we were able to reunite and one where we weren't. So we had a mom um, and child come to the Burks facility. And when you're separated from a spouse that you legitimately, literally arrived with, it, it's horrific for, for a mom. Um, because they don't know how to care for their kid at the same time with dealing with their own trauma and kid doesn't really understand that that is gone. So we had a family land in the Miami airport and Miami is uh, CBP is pretty difficult. Oh, and can I just oh, CBP stands for Customs Border Protection. So that's the agency that's responsible for enforcement at the border and at our airports. And um, dad and uh, dad stayed in a facility in florida in um, btc i believe is the facility mm -hmm. and mom and kid came to birth so one half the family's in florida the other half is here and um, when the mom told me that they had been separated um, i was horrified right so i got on a plane and i went to see dad in btc and I said, you know, we're going to try to put you back together. Let's see if we can figure out a way to put you back together. Um, so there is a settlement agreement called the Flores Settlement. And um, I'm very involved in that because I work so much with children. And there's certain rights that are in that settlement that you are entitled to. Uh, one is the appropriateness of how children are detained. In any event, I, I often use those rights um, to help kids. So taking your dad away to me is pretty horrific. Um, so I drafted up a whole lawsuit and I sent it to some of the attorneys that I know in the uh, Department of Justice. And I was like, I'm gonna sue you for family separation because this is family separation. Um, and I, I was ready to do it, ready to file it. I even had an attorney like in my office, I remember over a weekend drafting a very long complaint. And I get an email from the attorney and they're like, he's on a plane. We're bringing him back. We're bringing him to, to her. Brought him together. Then I started to see it more often. It was just yeah. this habit. Then I do the same thing dad brought. Um, and reuniting these families in the Burks facility of all places and then they'd be released together. There was one case that I couldn't do um, that, that for some reason they wouldn't reunite. And it was an interior apprehension, actually. There was a family uh, apprehended in the United States um, and they took dad to um, Seattle, Tacoma, mm -hmm. and mom and kid here. So imagine that, Tacoma, Seattle, Washington, rest of the family, Pennsylvania, across the country. Um, and dad was set to be removed from the United States. He had an individual hearing. So one of your clinic, former, former Penn State students, I sent her on a plane out to Seattle to do an individual hearing for this guy. Wouldn't you know it, he won his case. So he gets released because he won, and then we return mom to him. So not only, not only were they reunited, but permanent benefit uh, forever. But if they didn't have attorneys, yeah. like what happens? Like why, you know, why does, uh, uh, an administration or an agency, why do they act like that? Why do you make the decision to send a, one parent to one place and another to another? Why do you take a parent from a child? You don't have to do that. And we'll talk about discretion, yeah. right? You don't have to do that. And the idea is, is because the role, the purpose of this, this system, the way that it is working is to deport people to compel deportations, to make it so painful and so hard that you give up. They wanted those moms to give up. 
they wanted the dads to give up. But the thing that helped them not give up was to have access not only to counsel, but just to that hope that something good might happen. I can, I can withstand this, like do what you want to me, but I, as long as I can fight, I'm okay. Um, people that are isolated and alone in facilities, language issues, other issues, um, they lose hope. And when you lose hope, you give up. Um, so again, law students' role is that when you meet, sometimes going to these facilities, detention centers is important just because they need someone to talk to. They need to know that people know they're there. They need to know what the process is. They need to know what their options are. People that are there don't know anything and they feel like it's hopeless. And one of the terrible things about family detention was always kids never knowing when somebody, when they were leaving, right? Is today my day to leave out the front door or am I leaving on a plane? And the unknowing, the constant unknowing was probably the most traumatic thing that I, I saw children go through, um, apart from them watching their friends get taken, which is another horrific thing. Well, there's there's a lot to unpackage there. I, and you told I, me to talk. So um, no, I'm so glad, and I, I won't unpackage every point, but I want to mention a few points. Um, Making a lawyer has a difference. It's kind of one lesson. There's no court appointed counsel in immigration proceedings, and it's connected to the idea that immigration is civil. So many of the protections that exist in the criminal justice system don't exist um, in the immigration system. And it doesn't matter if you're detained. It doesn't matter how old you are. Um, you could be an infant. You could be an infant, and we're going to talk about mm -hmm. one year olds mm -hmm. in immigration court soon. Um, but I wanted to um, talk about one of my favorite subject areas, discretion, which has come up a couple of times. And you and I have talked a lot about how family detention is ultimately a discretionary choice. It's a legal option sometimes, um, but it's ultimately a choice, even though the optics on the outside might make it sound or seem like a legal mandate or a legal requirement. Um, so, so you mentioned that last February, Berks was empty. So we no longer are detaining families at Berks. What do you think were the strongest policy arguments for ending family detention? First of all, all detention is discretionary, mm -hmm. not just family detention. It doesn't be, be. Well, even starting if, with family. Even if you're subject to mandatory <laughs> detention, it is discretionary. Um, the number one um, reason why ending family detention was important is because it's the right decision. Um, there is no necessity to harming the family unit. There is no reason why we should do that. Um, we should not do anything which would purposefully harm children. Um, it just was such an unnecessary thing. And I remember when the, the Trump administration was ending and we were going into the Biden administration, everybody was providing their policy recommendations, right? And the one thing that everybody agreed on, I don't think you could, we're on a, a single like discussion about what it should look like in the future where somebody didn't say, well, and, and family detention. You didn't even need a summary of why. It was like, this is a no brainer. Like you don't do this. Um, look at history. We had Japanese internment. Nobody looks back on that now and is like, that was a pretty good idea. Nobody says that. And we accepted it for seven years by hiding it really. Yeah. If you look at the Dilly, if you look at pictures of Dilly, which like you can only find like these Getty images, right? It looks like the same as the Japanese internment pictures, right? Um, Berks is a, a different animal with the way that it looks, but at the same time, it's the same concept. Mm -hmm. Holding families in confinement for no reason at all. Um, the consequences to, to children's well being in the family unit are so great that it should never be a choice to detain families, it shouldn't be an acceptable choice. 
It should never be accepted in communities. It should never be accepted in our society. It's not the way that a society that values human life would accept. Mm -hmm. um, it just makes it absolutely made no sense. And it, you know, it, trying to explain, for example, to my relatives, because I have super conservative relatives, some of them, they just didn't understand um, anything, why anything that I was saying was actually actually happening, um, because even they uh, agreed that it's just not okay. And I know one of the things that our clinic and Aldea partnered on was in talking to, to the Biden Harris transition team. Um, and that's in one of the materials, kind of our policy recommendation. Um, but I do want to talk about the counter argument, um, which and it's you've mentioned it already. Um, because we heard this counter argument more than once during the era of family detention, and we continue to hear it now during the era of continued immigration detention, and that is deterrence and the, the sort of idea that detention acts as a deterrence. How would you respond to that? Well, it, it doesn't deter migration. So that's the simple answer. It doesn't deter migration. Um, but also, uh, do we really want to be a society that in order to, to dissuade others, we hurt you know, a group of people? Like, what kind of a decision is that? But the, the real answer for people that believe that we need deterrence is that it's actually not effective at all. It doesn't deter anyone. Immigration ebbs and flows with for different reasons, mainly because people are seeking at this moment, it's because people are seeking safety. And the reality is, is if you're a mom or a child or a family and you are in danger, you're not going to stay where you are. And there's no, you know, Berks County facility that's going to prevent you from making sure your child lives. Mm -hmm. They're going to make the decision to, to save themselves, to save their families. Um, deterrence does not Deterrence in the form of detention does not deter migration because the alternative for them is worse. Death is worse. You know, losing your child is worse. Um, it's not going to deter migration at all. In fact, the, the way that you might dissuade certain types of migration is to reimagine the system into something more, something better, something more humanitarian. Um, and then you might find more, you know, more avenues that are, are functional as opposed to dysfunctional. So we're now in an era under the Biden administration where currently no families are being detained, um, but we are seeing expansions to immigration detention across the country and particularly in Pennsylvania. Yeah. Um, so just in the last few months, we've seen um, the reopening of Berks um, and also about 30 miles from where we are in Phillipsburg is the Mishannon facility, which is holding hundreds of um, adults. Uh, so I, I want you to tell me in your own words, you know, what the demographics of those facilities look like today and how Aldea is responding. And remember, detention is discretionary, right? So when they released the families from Berks, it was in a single day. We just got a phone call that said, we're releasing your clients. You want to pick them up? When we're releasing this person, you want to pick them up? Like, I didn't file a single thing. I didn't have to do anything. It was immigration saying, well, today we're changing our minds. We're going to do something different. You're all free, free to go. So believe me, the families were happy. But at the same time, it's frustrating, right, to know that, you know, you're kind of like spinning, you're like in a hamster wheel you know, fighting the system when really it doesn't have to exist at all. Now in Pennsylvania, we're in a really terrible time in Pennsylvania. So families aren't detained. That's great. Um, but in Mashannon, the, there's a facility here that is 1800 beds plus. That's the largest detention center in Pennsylvania ever. Um, and it's new and it's privately owned, you know, because detention is about profits. In, in Berks, they decided that we should create a, a, a facility for nonviolent women, right? 
a facility to detain nonviolent women, which begs the question, then why do you need to detain them at all, right? Um, a facility for nonviolent women. And then they make a caveat that it's gonna specialize in young women. So 18, 19, 20, 21 years old. Um, so in the Mishanan facility right now, um, you have people that are there because they're being transferred from other parts of the country, because now here you got some open beds. The people from all over the country are being transferred here. Um, people are being transferred here um, because they have violated the law in some way. They're there too. And we're getting border transfers, which means that the government has decided that it is um, a good financial decision to take people from the southern border and fly them all the way to Pennsylvania instead of just releasing them as is in their discretion, right? Because detention is a discretionary choice um, to Pennsylvania um, so that they can be detained here at a cost to all of us taxpayers. Um, the types of populations that are there are, you know, it's in the Shannon, it's every country, right? There's no limit. In, in Berks, it's interesting because um, it seems like they're collectively going in waves. Berks is much smaller, so it's going to be more or less a capacity of 100 to 150, depending on you know COVID restrictions. But um, we saw a wave of Haitian women was our first detained population majority, and now we're seeing um, um, uh, Latin Latin countries uh, and South American countries. Um, and it is true right now in the Burke facility, there's an 18 year old and she was detained um, at the same time as her mother and her sibling and her stepfather. They released mother and stepfather and sibling, but they detained 18 year old daughter by herself in that facility. Somebody made that choice, right? So mom, like family, is on the western side of the country. Daughter is by herself in this facility, unable to leave. Like who made that choice? These are the types of people, right, that end up in these facilities. So that was actually the first call that we got, was not actually from daughter. Mom called. Mom called because somebody gave her our number because they said, oh, these are the people that work there. Mom called hysterical, you know, I don't, I can't, you know, I don't know what to do for her. Like, why did they take her? Um, but we very soon realized that um, the women that are there, very young women, um, there's a lot of separation. There's moms that are separated from their sons. There's um, siblings that were separated. There's a, um, a woman who's in her 50s who presented with her sister and sister was released, other sister not. Like why? Why make those actual custody decisions? Detention is a choice. It's a cruel choice. Um, it's a choice for profits because every person that's in these facilities is, they have a, um, a per day capita, right? They're valued at some price per day. And so those beds have to be filled at the expense of families, at the expense of, of everything. And um, the people that are in the Berks facility right now, um, very confused because there's very little in-person, there's no in-person legal access. So they really have no idea why they're there or what process they're in. It's really hard. Um, in Mashannon, it's just sheer volume, right? There's not enough people to, to help. So again, um, an ethical concern that our administration should have is, should we detain more people than can be represented? Because you're right that they're not guaranteed lawyers. They're in the same types of facilities that people with criminal um, charges are. They're not guaranteed a lawyer. The youngest child that we represented in a facility was 11 days old. And funny story, which we'll get to, but when we talk about the case, right. I'm gonna stop. Okay. No, no, I'm not gonna stop you, but we may not get to every question. Yeah, good. well, I told um, you long winded. Um, because you have such rich stories to share. Um, and I'm, I'm glad you're continuing the mantra of detention as a choice because most of immigration enforcement is a choice. 
Um, and, and up until this time, we've been talking mainly about detention. And so I, I did want to at least introduce the sort of broader landscape of immigration enforcement, which includes a much broader set of enforcement actions that could include for the audience's benefit, arresting someone, issuing them charging documents, placing them in deportation proceedings, physically deporting them. These are all choices um, that are in our immigration enforcement system. And um, I saw a statistic today, um, a, 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 a empirical study uh, was published showing that a third of the most recent charging documents issued to immigrants um, in this last fiscal year were juveniles, um, ages zero to 17. And within this subset, um, over 32,000 of these charging documents were issued to children um, ages zero to four. So, and this is March, 2022, um, where the administration has committed to a humane immigration policy and where issuing someone a charging document or placing them in removal proceedings is a choice. Mm -hmm. So I guess my question to you is, how did we get here? Um, and you know, what experiences do you have with kids in court? I'm gonna start with how it, how it was or it probably still is. So like I said, the youngest child I, I represented was an 11 day old baby that started in family detention. Um, I kept the case. By the way, I think that she is, she's definitely in elementary school now and case still ongoing. Um, so I don't even know how many years that is. So still ongoing, but I remember going to her first court because they served her an MTA at 11 days old that said that she was coming to the United States to work. It's funny, right? Yeah. But not uncommon. <laughs> no, it said she was coming to work, very young um, employee. Um, so I, I, um, it's, it's a case that I went to court and I was like, I'm denying everything. Prove that you served this 11 day old baby. It was just complete, completely terrible process that was chosen to be levied against her. Um, they refiled the NTA because why not? Why not serve a, an infant two times um, charging documents that are, again, unnecessary? Um, and I went to court with the child who at the time I think had maybe turned one not speaking and um, the, the baby was in a car seat. So I was like, mom, stay in the back. I don't even want you to come to the, the table. I'm going up with my client. So I went to the, the table with my client in a car seat and I put her on the table. And the judge is like, where's the client? I'm like, in the car seat. <laughs> this, and he's like, well, isn't the mom in court? And ironically, they did not put the mom in court, just the baby. So. I'm like, no, this is, this is the respondent. And he's like, he's like, I guess I can't ask what the language is. And I'm like, your guess is as good as mine. And it was time to plead right to the charges. And I said, um, I can't plead because I can't talk to my client, but the government is more than welcome to question the client. <laughs> <laughs> so we actually had to have a contested hearing because obviously they couldn't ask the the child anything but I mean that's the ridiculousness yeah, of it right yeah the baby in the car seat at the at the council table very happy in the in the car seat <laughs> but the ridiculousness of that right so when you see that that they are serving notices to appear on on children it is a choice so imagine a different system imagine a system where they just didn't issue those orders or those notices mm -hmm. Imagine if like unaccompanied children arrived at the, the port of entry or anywhere, and we gave them a lawyer and we were like, apply for the benefit to which you're entitled. And we'll deal with that later. 
there's no reason to issue a single notice to appear to a single minor. They're not legally capable of doing it. And to expect the parent to make the choices for the child, probably not the most appropriate thing either. Um, there's going to be a lot of kids since 2014, a lot of kids that are going to grow up in the United States and have removal orders that maybe they don't even know about. They had no role in getting. Yeah. Um, why do that? Why put them in the process to begin with? And and this is the, the dilemma of enforcement, right? We don't have to deport every person we encounter. And we can. We can. You don't have to issue every person you encounter a warrant for arrest. You don't have to issue them a notice to appear because the laws actually provide benefits. The laws are not written just to enforce, but they're also written to provide access to benefits. So unaccompanied kids, they could very much apply for something called a special immigrant juvenile visa, right? So if they probably qualify for that benefit, why are they getting issued that notice at all? It's, it's a waste and don't even get me started with the backlog of how many cases are pending in our immigration courts that are overwhelming the system. Imagine there's 30,000 children's cases in that backlog just from last year that don't have to be there. Um, why do we have to deport every person we encounter and place them in a deportation process that's arduous um, without giving them first the opportunity to seek the benefit to which they're entitled? So let's, let's use an example. A Ukrainian family comes to the border right now. If they came to the border and were actually able to somehow manage around Title 42, right? Which Title 42, by the way, is the, the COVID order that has sealed our southern border. So when you watch the news and they say that the border is a disaster, that's just a lie because we're expelling everyone. So what expelling means is that we're not even deporting you. We're not even allowing you to talk. We're just putting you on a plane or kicking you back with no process at all. So if you can get around that hurdle um, and you can actually, you know, process through Customs and Border Protection, the first paper they give you is a warrant for your arrest and a notice to appear in a deportation court. They don't give you, here's lawyers that can help you apply for asylum because you're probably going to want to apply for that. Instead, we give you a notice to go to court. We don't give you the first opportunity to seek a benefit to which you're probably entitled and certainly are entitled to apply for. Instead, we start with deportation. And that's the system. The system is to start with deterrence, start with deportation. That's where we, that's at the get, that's at the start. Uh, we don't start with the benefits. And, you know, immigration's job is to enforce all of the laws, not just the laws that deport people. And it's, it's been a really long time since I've been in a system where um, it's not extremely adversarial, right? Mm -hmm. Where it's like, everything's a fight. Um, even the very straightforward cases um, are a battle and they shouldn't be. Those kids, the very simple answer is, is they shouldn't have been issued a notice to appear mm -hmm. to begin with. Um, but that, here we are. Yeah, here we are. And, and it really also underscores that cho these choices are available throughout the system, right? From the very beginning, when you arrive at the border, if you are arriving at a border, to um, already being in the United States. Um, so uh, one of the easiest ways to even save the government resources is to stop issuing notices to appear in an already overwhelmed immigration court system. Yeah. I have so many more questions, but I, uh, but I, I wanna ask one question about race, because we haven't named it specifically, and then hopefully we can open it up for questions. Um, and just for, for benefit of the audience, you know, we, have an, we have an immigration statute where um, many of the laws are facially neutral, um, but they, they impact immigrants differently based on race and country of birth. Um, and it's for a few reasons. And in 1996, Congress, as you know, um, really amended our statute so that criminality was the centerpiece for who got detained and deported. Um, and as a result, the 
the racism you see in the criminal justice system spills over to the immigration system, um, because if you encounter the criminal system, you are more likely to be detained and deported. Um, and other way that we see racial disparities um, has also been in family detention, right? What you mentioned um, the large Haitian population at Berks, um, and in you know one source put you know the detention of Haitians at a much higher level for for families um, than any other population, and then the Title Forty Two expulsions um, where the the disparate impact is on on Haitians and Black majority countries. Uh, so any experience you have, there's much greater attention being paid um, to the role of race in immigration enforcement. We have a new memo by the Secretary of Homeland Security that says that enforcement actions should not have a discriminatory impact. Um, any experiences of you know, seeing race play out in, in the work that you do, how did we get here? Well, the system that you just described is was created on the concept of racism. That's just the reality of it. Immigration enforcement is based in racism, incarceration, and profits. That's what drives the system. That's the only that's the only thing that seems to to be cared about in the enforcement area. They don't care to enforce benefits. And does it disparately impact uh, black people, people from African countries, Haitian folks, and other ethnicities or, or um, nationalities that are targeted a thousand million percent, without a doubt. The detention system is full of Black, Haitian, and African people that are in long-term detention. They're in detention the longest. They are the most language isolated. They have the highest bonds. They are in the worst parts of the country, so the parts of the country where you have much higher denial rates, they're more likely to be found not credible, meaning like not believable in a court. Um, it's, um, it's amazing to me the difference that a, a Black person faces in the immigration court system than even um, a, a Spanish person faces in the immigration system. It's, it's incredible, the differences. And you can see it in the application of Title 42, which is um, again, the COVID restriction at the border that has sealed the border. When, Co when Title 42 began, they prioritized expelling Haitians, right? The expelling of people from the Northern Triangle countries, Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador, they were expelled to Mexico. Bad enough. Haitians weren't received by Mexico. Haitians were expelled to Haiti. You know what that is? That's a deportation. It's not an expulsion because they're not being sent to a country that they don't have a fear, right? They're being returned, expelled to a country that they fear persecution. That's refoulement, that's illegal, but they did it. They did it without, you know, with no one questioning it. Um, the, the images that you saw of Haitians on the border, that's just like a drop in the bucket to the, the number of violations that occurred um, to Haitians seeking protection. Um, and it's still happening. I think, and I, I'm going to be wrong about the, the actual number because it's probably higher than what I'm going to say, 20,000 Haitian expulsions this year. It's March, right? Higher than anyone else. Do you know how many people we deported to Ukraine last year? 200. So is there a racial impact or is there racism in the immigration enforcement system? Absolutely. Because um, people that are of, of of, um, that are Black or are Haitian or are African won't get the benefit of the doubt in the system. They will languish in detention. Um, they're less likely to have attorneys, very little language access. They're also more likely to be the victims of violence inside detention at the hands of authorities. And they're also more likely to not get medical care inside facilities. I remember reading um, medical records for detained uh, Haitian women where they were literally, it was said in their records that they were embellishing, right? embellishing their symptoms. Yeah. Crazy. And I think, I, I'm not going to say what the, the medical issue was in one particular case, but it ended up being 
she certainly wasn't lying, but that initial uh, trigger to not believe resulted in her not receiving care. The system is, is built for those, those three reasons, racism, incarceration, and profit. And until we get away from those ideas, um, you're not gonna have a humane system, you can't. There needs, it needs to be benefit focused, humanitarian focused at the outset. Um, and will you ever address those issues um, or solve those issues? Probably not. But I have seen nothing to actually start addressing those issues. I haven't seen people go into detention centers and find those issues of, of uh, disparate treatment. There should be a task force. There should be people going in there and, and you know, holding to account yeah. those problems and finding solutions. There's nobody finding solutions. It's just still happening. Well, that leaves us with a lot to think about. And really what's coming out of, you know, a way forward is what does it mean to have a system, right? That's, that's informed by compassion um, and fairness um, and humanitarian considerations. Uh, so first, thank you, Bridget, for this conversation. It, we learned a lot. And thank you for everything you do every day and at night. Um, and I think we'll now see if there are questions or comments. Thank you, speakers. Thank you, Ms. Bridget Cambria, for sharing your reach and such an experience. Yeah, so we're ready to start the Q&A portion. So if you're here in person, uh, you can approach the microphone uh, there on the stage left and ask your question there. And for those on Zoom, we will be reading out questions submitted to the Q&A. Um, so we'll kind of alternate back and forth here as we get going. You hear me okay? Thank you so much for your work. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here. And, and, and just, to, but it's more like, it's a question, but like grist for, for, your, for your mill, if you will. Uh, and, and, and I also, as I imagine the racism also applies to indigenous folks. You know, uh, in a place like Mexico, there's still 54 indigenous languages that are spoken. And it's just this bizarre form of settler colonialism where now indigenous folks are themselves get deported, a place like the United States. But I was wondering if you could talk about the other aspect. What, what people are, are usually surprised to find out, I was very surprised to find out, was that for a long time there were like zero criminal um, penalties for uh, immigration violations. And we've gradually increased those. And, and I, if, I, if I remember correctly, if you are, um, if you enter unlawfully a second time, there's something like a 20 year prison sentence attached to something like that. And in fact, what they do is, uh, you know, they put you in these detention centers and they say, you know, you're gonna be here for years and years and years possibly, or you can sign these deportation orders and you can leave. But when you sign this thing, and then if you come back, you are subject to like the, you know, the like actual prison time. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if you could, you could say something about the the prison, like how you these, this thing is supposed to be an administrative law. So it's actually run by the executive. It's like the judge, jury, and executioner. It's like this Alice in Wonderland thing, right? They, mm -hmm. they, it's not even like the judicial branch of, of the government. It's like the executive gets to do all these decisions, and you can be sentenced to actual prison time. It's it's insane. Anyway, I, I wonder if you had some thoughts on that or or, so, or things that that you've experienced. Them. I do. And, and um, first, as with regard to indigenous populations, it's an absolute uh, horror because there are indigenous people and indigenous language speakers stuck in detention that have never been spoken to in their language. And I see it all the time in court, um, in detention court, where they're put in a, in, a, in a court hearing, not understanding what's happening, not being able to communicate and not being given the type of access that everyone else has or should have. And it's not met with like, we're gonna help you and we're gonna make sure you're represented and we're gonna make sure we always get your language right, right? It's met with frustration because it's more difficult. It's, oh, now I gotta find an interpreter and we can't find an interpreter. Well, can't you just do it in Spanish? Like just do it in Spanish. And then we'll you know, do your whole hearing and then maybe we won't find you credible. You know, so I mean, it's it's a huge problem, and there should actually be a question as to whether people with language 
uh, rare languages should be detained at all, but they are. They are. Um, as far as the, the criminal penalties for uh, entering, you are correct. So if there's multiple entries on uh, after a removal order is issued, if you enter a subsequent time, you can be charged federally. And the, the punishments are ridiculous. And those are written into the law, right? So there's a problem with that, though. And the majority, by the way, it's sort of like they're disappeared into the system. So when, when they're encountered following um, a removal order, if they are referred to a prosecutor, which happens only at the discretion of um, the person deciding, um, they will be transferred into federal custody in a federal prison, um, and they will be subjected to a federal court um, and be subjected to those laws. And the penalties are written into the law, extremely, extremely harsh penalties. So the majority of people will plead, right? Because they're facing something substantial. They'll serve anywhere from time served to months, even if they plead. And the problem with that is that if you enter a subsequent time after an order is issued, that doesn't mean that you're not entering with a reason. So there is, there is a benefit that's permitted for people that have orders of removal called withholding of removal or protection under the Convention Against Torture, that's your entitlement. So you should be afforded an opportunity to be interviewed first. And if you establish that benefit, why are you being referred if you're legally entitled right to a benefit? It goes to the whole discretionary component, but we will punish first. They won't get access to the asylum system until they've been punished first. Um, so that's why you see those types of um, incarcerations. Also, the the initial entry criminal penalty, which is very, very small. It's like like, ticket, like a ticket. That's what they use during family separation to coerce the separation. So they, what they did was summarily charge every parent with a child with this summary offense, which by the way, the parents received a $10 fine. That's it. That was the ticket that they got. And the consequence was they lost their child. So, I mean, it's not a great system. I wish I could be more positive. I will be more positive. Than getting on. But you're right, you know, you're right. I just wanted to make one dis distinction because we, we've been talking about, you mentioned administrative, um, that yes, most of immigration violations are civil immigration violations and go through the system that we've been talking about in this hour. Um, but there are criminal penalties for certain immigration related crimes, including unlawful entry, re-entry. Um, even if those all went away, there would still be civil immigration consequences, right? So yeah. you could make an unlawful entry, not face criminal prosecution, but still be placed in removal proceedings for being present without admission. Um, so that's just an important point that you're in two systems of justice um, in certain scenarios. We have the following questions from the Q&A section. Ms. Christine asks, does the speaker, Ms. Mr. Ms. Bridget Cambria, believe the administration message intended to newcomers work in deterring more families to come to the US? Um, did Congress intend that? The administration? Um, absolutely, right? They, they go on TV and they say, don't come here. Or, you know, I mean, it's very clear that that's their, their intended purpose of the immigration system. The problem is, is that concept and that idea actually does not follow with the laws that exist, right? So the, the deter and deport wing, which by the way is by and large the entire immigration system is based on deter and deport. Um, the, the problem with that is that laws exist and laws were actually, the, the laws were created by Congress, but our immigration system does a very good job of not permitting access to the benefits that are written in the laws. And it's unfortunate that you would need a lawyer to even access those literally written benefits that you're entitled to under the law. Um, but often that you, you do because our enforcement system is based first on deporting as many people as possible, as quickly as possible not on making sure that you receive whatever benefits you're eligible under the law. Okay, so thank you so much for your talk and, and also giving us all this incredibly valuable information. I learned so much just from being here. 
So I'll speak to a different aspect of immigration law, and I guess I have a question that stems from that. So I, I noticed that uh, a repeated theme of tonight's talk has been the word discretion. And that's certainly my own experience of the immigration system. So to my, my understanding, to get a green card, you had to apply, do the medical test, and then have a formal in-person interview. Uh, and you couldn't decide when that was. They would just give you a date and you'd have to show up, and that was that. So I applied for a green card in 2020, and that was the year where they just straight up scrapped all the interviews and just sent people green cards. And I just got my surprise green card. And I was just like, what is this? What am I even looking at? And, and so that's, I guess, a more positive aspect of things. But I wonder if you could speak to just how, who makes these decisions, right? Like quite literally who decides to just scrap all the interviews and how discretionary is immigration law relative to other uh, facets of US law. It's funny because after 2020, they changed it to requiring everybody to be interviewed, even in the clear cut cases. So it's kind of reverted back. But I mean, honestly, whether you are successful in the system or not, it a lot of time depends on luck. It depends on where you live. It depends on uh, what you look like. It depends on you know what category is you're lucky enough to, to be a part of. Um, who makes those rules? The laws have been the same since right now, 1996. But how many different news stories have you seen about different things happening at the border? Because it's policy. So there are people making those choices. There was an article where they talked about Stephen Miller and his plan during the Trump administration. And his goal was, one, to keep immigrants out of court. That was one goal. But the other was to create, create as many hurdles as possible to get to court or to get to a benefit. So that was that was the goal. And that wasn't a law. You know, the law has been the same. Everyone, I get so many calls in the office and they're like, I saw in the news that a new law passed where I can get this now. I'm like, the laws have been the same since 1996. It hasn't changed. Um, but there are policy changes that substantially impact people's lives, right? DACA, the Deferred um, Action for Childhood Arrivals, is one you know, huge example and easy to identify. But things as simple as um, whether you're detained or not, that is discretionary. Whether you have an interview or not, that's discretionary. Whether um, we want to give you a green card or not, that's discretionary. Whether you get citizenship, discretionary. Like Every component of the system is discretionary. And unfortunately, the immigration system, and this is the problem, is at the ebb and flow of an executive. And I can tell you that in my career, which is unfortunately now like 16 or 17 years, there's never been an administration that was like, let's get it right and let's do it. Like every fix has failed. And, you know, it's really funny because sometimes I watch videos of like Ronald Reagan and the way that he would speak about immigrants. And I'm like, wow. Why don't our leaders talk like that? And that's a, you know, a conservative president, right? You know, talking about the value of immigrants and, you know, now I can't get away from vilifying them. You know, I dreamed sometimes when those kids that we represented were in jail for like two years, I dreamed for the news story, someone to cover like what these kids were going through, like, please, like somebody listen to them. Now I, I don't even want to see it on the news because one of the things that I, I learned was that most of the things you see on, on the news are not true because the immigration system is so complex and so dysfunctional that what works for one person is not gonna work for another. Every person is like, well, my fr so-and-so's friend like got this this quickly, why am I waiting so long? Every case is different, unfortunately. But congratulations, I'm, I'm glad you're here. Uh, we have another question from the Zoom. So this is from Andrew, Andrew Sandoval Strauss. He asks, to expand on the idea of racial disparities in immigration enforcement, would you be willing to comment on how the invasion of Ukraine and the consequent refugee flows might change or not immigration enforcement and public sentiment about migration to the United States? Well, on my drive up here, I actually listened to the Secretary of State got asked the question of, um, you know, the, the countries next to Ukraine are absorbing so many refugees. What are we going to do, right, to help with the refugees? What are we going to do 
for the ones that that will arrive um, at our country. And his answer was, they probably want to stay close to home. That was his answer, which to me is a crazy answer, right? Um, there are Ukrainian families and, and asylum seekers at the southern border right now, and they are being subjected to Title 42, which means they're being returned to Mexico. Um, it to me is incredible, but one of the things that um, that what what's happening is sort of educating everyone is maybe what countries should be doing, right? Poland, I think, has absorbed two million refugees. We would never do that. Like, there's never been a, a time when we would do that. Haiti is a great example, and that's probably the, the purpose of this question because it's entirely based in race. The the president of Haiti was assassinated. People, you know, and and it was a completely political uh, reason. And the the communities in Haiti are being um, being really severely harmed by uh, by groups that they call bandits, but are entirely be late, uh, based in political issues. Um, so for them, they're fleeing extreme real violence, right? And they're our neighbor. They are our neighbor. So they are our responsibility. So what is our response? Not to do like, like Poland has done, which is, you know, I, I saw like people come over and there's like trampolines for the kids and there's like donuts and tea and people waiting there to take them into their homes. They're paying people. To, to receive families, all of those things, kind of just ideas that you could come up with as you would a, like a, a humane response. Our response is you get the same laws we've always had and we have created no systems to address our own neighbors, our own problems. We've never done it, um, but we have to do it. So the only thing that, the only good thing that could come from this being a refugee crisis, which it is, is to understand and learn how we should be receiving people that end up on our borders. Um, and it certainly shouldn't be deporting and expelling them. So I think we have time for one more question. Oh, no, there's... So, um, Bridget, I'm going to start by saying I want it to be you. Um, I wanted to be you. I wanted to be a lawyer. I wanted to be someone who would You're young. shape things materially. <laughs> You're very young. I'm young, <laughs> but I'm in the philosophy program here. <laughs> and what motivated me to you can st you can do still philosophy. do it. We had a, in my law school we had a musician. He was in, so you can do it. <laughs> I want to be an academic. <laughs> yes. And the reason why though, the reason why is because you know I worked uh, in a nonprofit in Los Angeles that did a lot of direct action, um, a lot of work representing people. But what I saw was exactly what you experienced um, at the detention center, right? Where you're just part of the system. There's no way to disrupt it if you're there. You might change things materially for individuals, but you're still part of the system. So that's why I decided to uh, try philosophy um, and see if I could answer these questions um, in a broader sense that maybe might you know, shed light on the way we justify uh, these horrible, horrible, and arbitrary uh, ways of treating people, right? So my question for you, and the question that always preoccupies me is, you know, the answer is not to change the laws so that they become criminal laws, right? We don't want that either. But then how do we swing discretion to a more favorable way, right? Like, what can we, how, how do we address this? And I wanted to hear your thoughts. I mean, I know that's an enormous question, right? But I would just, since you're a practitioner who does amazing work, what are your thoughts on this? We probably need philosophers. We need philosophers instead of like enforcers. You know, we need people that are thinking of, no, like thinking differently, right? From a different perspective. Everything's about national security or like, it's crazy that, it, you know, the kids in family detention were called national security risks. That's how it started. Absolutely insane. It's because the, the, the adults in the room are not the adults that should be there. We need different thinkers, different points of view. We need uh, different policies and just a completely different, um, we need to start it over. I mean, I mean, that's just my own point of view. We need to start it over. Um, the enforcement system, um, and so what we were talking about, just, the enforcement system just comes from the wrong perspective. It's not about enforcing to help 
people. It's enforcing to deport people. So people are trained wrong. The wrong people are in the, the highest positions. Like it needs to change and it needs to, to turn into a system where we're doing what Poland is doing, right? We're receiving people, um, the people that are here that deserve benefits should be given that access um, to receive benefits. It has to, it has to restart. Um, so I, I thank you for your work in the nonprofit, by the way. Working in detention centers is one of the most traumatic things, right? And I think I've done it so long that I'm like numb, which is probably really unhealthy. But at the same time, it's really good work. And I have your dilemma all the time, where I feel like I'm propping up a system. The only, the only reason I've stayed in it so long is I'm extremely client-centered. I can't not do the work to help the individual people. The problem is that then I'm the problem too, right? So how do you fix that? I would much rather be helping a whole bunch of kids that aren't in an immigration court because they don't have to be. So the system just needs to be reconfigured and reimagined. And you know, if you look at something, you know, an agency like ICE, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, um, maybe somebody should ask them if their job is not just to deport people and maybe enforce the giving of the benefits under the law instead of just the, the taking. Um, that's just where I am. And that might be um, a, a good way to end tonight. Um, Bridget, thank you again. <laughs> And, and for the students that are here, um, you have a very exceptional professor. So thank you, Shoba. How many years, right? <laughs> I needed a teacher like Shoba. So good night to those on Zoom. Yeah, thank you for hanging on and um, thanks to our audience members and um, hopefully we'll see many tomorrow. Thank you everyone. Thank you.